Ladies and gentlemen, here she is, the hilarious Kathy Griffin. and scalding hot tea. This morning, and this is real, this morning I was woken up by the FBI. So they came to my house. And for anyone who's watching this and thinking like, oh, when is that bitch gonna stop talking about that fucking picture? Well, it turns out, guess who was on the MAGA bombers target list? Yes. So they showed up and I'm just glad, when I say I'm glad to be here, like seriously, I was afraid. <laughs> Let me sort of work backwards and I'm gonna be all over the map because I'm gonna tell you all of like the horror of the Trump stuff because I honestly really believe that if it happened to me, it can happen to you and it is happening to other people. So let me just start with how the picture keeps getting like ginned up over and over, right? Okay, so besides the fact that the MAGA bomber doesn't care for my work, <laughs> So anyway, um, a few months ago, remember the scandal with the Roseanne show getting canceled? Okay, and then if you remember, the very next day was what I call the fake Samantha Bee full frontal scandal. Thank you, because that was a joke that was, I feel, completely fair, and, you know, feckless totally has it coming. Now, so what happened is <laughs> this whole this whole process, this whole thing that I'm going to tell you about tonight is what I now um, call the Trump wood chipper. And D-list as I am, I was kind of the first like celebrity to be thrown into the Trump wood chipper because my photo, the infamous photo, which by the way, was a mask with ketchup on it. Can we be clear? It was a mask with ketchup, I promise. So I've had to travel the world. I started in Auckland, New Zealand. I had to go to Reykjavik, Iceland to tell my dick jokes. Reykjavik, Iceland. That's right. I actually get offended when people are like, you got Dixie chicked. And I'm like, no, no, I got Dixie dicked, okay? <laughs> Everybody turned on me, left, right, center, the military. Fucking Alyssa Milano tweeted against me. <laughs> Alyssa Milano, for God's sake. Here's the thing, you know the maggots? I call them maggots. So, and I, I mean, I don't mean Republicans, I mean like, you know, the MAGA hat wearing like crazies and let's, let's cut the shit. They're all fucking nuts and they're not into reading or writing. Um, oh no, I know this is dark, but I brought you one of my death threats. Hold on, hear me out. Only because um, it's a great example of how the MAGA fans, um, the Trump fans, they're not really big on grammar. Anyway, um, a few months ago, I, um, um, we've all had that time when you wake up and there's too many texts on your phone, right? Like, that's not good. It's good to get an occasional hello, but when you're just flooded, and don't you like your friends that are nice and vague? Hey girl, are you okay? <laughs> OMG, call me. <laughs> I'm here if you need to talk. All right, just fucking tell me who died. So. What happened was, it turns out that um, the Roseanne scandal had happened, and Samantha Bee the next day, and so then Sarah Fuckabee Sanders decided to just, yes, fuck her, fuck that liar. She is a liar! She is lying to us! Oh, I'm going hard for all of them, I don't give a fuck anymore. I'm going for everybody and anybody, and fuck her for knowing she's lying still lying, and I know this is vicious, but I'm gonna go there because they go there. Does one gay here have one goddamn belt to give that bitch? One belt, one belt for Sarah Fuckabee. Even a pillow has to be defined. I said it, I said it. And I know when my beloved Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. Michelle, I love you. Take the night off, because I'm fucking down in the mud with the pigs where I belong, rolling around, rolling around. Down with me. Oh, 
right where I belong. What made me a star, goddammit? All right, so we have a precedent. And I use that word because he tweeted one time, I'm so proud to be your precedent. I'm like, oh, that shit sticks with me, honey. That sticks. You are the precedent now and forever. And when he twatted on the Twitter machine, I'm so happy the first lady, Melanie, is coming home today. You know, from the tit job. Allegedly, allegedly, I have no proof. I'm alleging. And I thought, all right, she's Melanie from now on. And also, fuck her. So I know some of the gays want to make her over because she's fierce. No, she's a 45-year-old grown woman. She's a birther. I threw up a clip on my Twitter of her saying how she was a birther. And fuck her with that green jacket. I really don't care, do you? Yes, I do care. And I know you care, too. <laughs> Melanie. All right, so... A couple of weeks ago, Don Jr. comes at me, and I love when all these middle-aged white guys try to like go comedically toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, right? They think it's gonna go their way. So Don Jr. tweets, the reason you don't have a special isn't because you're a woman, it's because you're not a good comedian. It's really that simple. And then I just wrote back, FYI, they don't have Netflix in prison. <laughs> Which is true. Oh, he got me. Oh, and we'll get to Stormy in a minute. I became friends with Stormy Daniels. She came to my Boston show. They snuck her back to my dressing room. And there she is with the tits and the hair and the smile and all of her glory. And I go, hi, Thelma, it's me, Louise. Let's take this fucker down. And And okay, so she couldn't have been nicer and more fun and everything. So you know I had to drag her into like a private room and get the real deal. I, first of all, I said to her, I go, do you want me to call you Stephanie or Stormy? And she goes, Stormy, I earned it. I go, she goes, I've sucked over 180,000 cocks. Half the gay guys here are like, and? And I said, look, I know you're gonna testify for Mueller, or maybe you have, I'm not gonna ask, but I have to, like, you have to tell me how bad the dick is, because <laughs> I'm picturing, like, zigzags and skin tags coming off, and like... <laughs> I love your reaction, because Stormy, who sucked 180,000 cocks, kept going, ew! And I go, I I'm sorry, are you overreacting? Because... You, you're going, ew, and she's like, ew, it was the worst one I've ever seen. I'm like, what? So then she's talking about the mushroom cap, and I'm like, oh, I hate that feeling where it pops in, but you've got to worry about the pop out because it might have, you know, it's fun going in, but you got to think about the exit. And I have to say, it's pretty impressive that I made Stormy Daniels think of his cock and go, ew. Um, you're welcome. All right, so. So anyway, so Sarah Fuckabee goes before uh, on the, at the White House press uh, briefing room yet again, and she tries to tie in Samantha B to Roseanne, which are completely apples and oranges, and here's why. Number one, if there's one thing I know, it's low-budget cable. And so I, when she, when she called Ivanka a feckless cunt, fair game, fair game. Hear me out, hear me out. All right, first of all, um, you can say the C word, all right? And I admit, I told you I'm gonna admit all my foibles, I admit I totally have a double standard. Like, I'm one of those women that if you're my girlfriend and want, we wanna call each other cunts, I think it's great. But if you're a guy, I'm like, how dare you? So, I admit it. All right, so um, what I think is funny, though, is that I actually think the Trumpers were more upset about the C word because I don't think they know what feckless means. <laughs> That's a big college word. That's a big college word. And I would be more insulted if someone called me feckless, implying I couldn't do my job. And I'd be like, excuse me, I take issue with that. I'm a cunt, but I'm a very good comedian. I know what I'm doing. I have a lot of experience. How dare you take it back? Oh my God, I love you guys. All right, so, so um, okay, so here's the joke that Samantha B did. And I'm gonna do the joke for you and I'm gonna defend it and here's why. Because number one, you don't want the President of the United States deciding what television shows you watch. So, you know, I learned, like I said, I was the test case and now I'm on this mission to make sure that they never, ever are allowed to do to anyone else what they did to me. Not Michelle Wolf from the White House Correspondence Center, not Samantha B, not anybody. Not someone in entertainment, not in any field. Not on my watch, no more, no way. No way, that is some bullshit. All right.
right, so like I said, Samantha Bee does this joke. Now, it was very early on in the border crisis, and I think a lot of you would agree that out of all the heinous things he's done, that is right up there. I mean, three of those children have died, and it's something I just, I'm not a religious person, but God forgive us for, for that. So what Sam- Samantha Bee said, and she does a political satirical show. So she said, mom to mom, let me say something to you, feckless cunt. Put on a tight dress, push your tits up, and go sit on daddy's lap and bounce until you fix it. Now, <laughs> number one, they bleeped the C word. Also, she is completely feckless. I, I know feckless, I have met her. Um, you know, it's like talking to a bag of Xanax. I'll just tell you right now. It is, <laughs> allegedly, I am not saying she takes five to 10 Xanax a day. I'm saying she reminds me of someone who does. <laughs> Oh my God, one time I was um, part of a different challenge on The Apprentice and Trump kind of put me next to Feckless. And so she was saying things like, you know, I think you should try a rosé colored nail polish. I I was just like, let's go. Honey, I got places to be. So, have you seen The Husband? Jared Kushner? Yes, soon to be imprisoned. All right, um, hopefully, hopefully. I can dream. I don't get the Kush thing. He's got the drag queen eyebrows. He looks like he gets 17 facials a day. Like his skin is, it's like he just took off a facial mask of his whole body every second, no matter what time you catch him. And he's supposed to be this genius, right? And so remember the time he just randomly took to the podium on the front uh, White House lawn? There is no collusion! There is no collusion! Like he's got a very odd way of talking where he, oh my God, oh my God, yes! but his voice is high! Like a fucking Alvin and the Chipmunks. I don't know what she sees in him. I don't get it, but I'm not buying that he's like the hot one. All right, so. <laughs> Not only have I known the Donald for way too long, but I also know all the grown kids. I don't know the little guy, but I know Eddie Munster, Feckless, and Date Rape. Now, oh yeah, I, I'm just saying, I can't imagine that anyone would have consensual sex with Eric Trump. That's all I'm saying. I think every encounter should be investigated. Every single encounter. <laughs> Oh, they're gonna twat at me now. Look out, everybody. All right, so um, they're all idiots, and the dad is the biggest idiot of all. And um, so, you know, it was obviously when he, they chose me to, if, if I may use the word target, I think they knew I was like an easy mark, right? So just so you know, out of all the dudes who supposedly threatened the president, none of them got in this kind of trouble, all right? He's not gonna go after Snoop Dogg, or the singer Morrissey, or fucking drunk Johnny Depp in a bar. <laughs> you guys. Johnny Depp, like, he dresses like that in real life. He does. He dresses like he's a pirate in real life. Have you noticed that? He's got a lot of money, or sometimes he does. I don't know what his money situation, it's like a Nicolas Cage, I don't know what's going on, but. The last time I saw him was at the Clive Davis Grammy party, and I just go, Johnny, one word, shower, shower. So I have have no love for all the guys that didn't get in any trouble, but I think they knew that they could come after me because as many of you know, I've been kind of a one-man band my whole career. You know, I don't have a big network or studio. I don't have any man behind me. I don't have some big producer who's gonna make it all better and make it all go away. Johnny Depp, he got caught saying something about the president and then four days later, he's taking a picture with his uh, Make-A-Wish kid. I know that game. All right, so yes, vicious. They'll do anything bottom line, vicious. All right, so. Once again, we'll go back to Sarah Fuckabee. All right, so there she goes to the podium and she's conflating Roseanne with Samantha Bee. And then for good measure, as usual, they just throw me in again. So then all the Trump army and the robots and the bot farms from Macedonia, whatever the fuck's going on, they all come to me. (laughs) And so I then later watched it when I got all these texts saying like, oh my gosh, you've got to, you know, watch today's press conference. And so I see Sarah up there saying, and uh, Roseanne was doing a very good job job on her show and she had to apologize but the president phoned her <laughs> Samantha B should not be able to keep her job <laughs> and where's the apology from comedian Kathy Griffin who was photographed holding Donald Trump's severed head <laughs> I had to start my process of debunking the idea that I was holding a severed head at all. It was a freaking mask with ketchup on it. Let's be very clear, it was not anyone's head. I don't have any heads. Although, wait till I tell you the stuff that Trumpers send to my house, you're gonna shit. To this day, Trumpers send me Bibles. Yes, I have like 60 Bibles in my basement. 
It's too late. It's too late. It's way too late for that. I went to Catholic school. It didn't work. Uh, it didn't take, as they say. So I will say it's amazing that they don't catch fire every time I just even walk past them. But your beloved Maggie Griffin, when she walks past them, she goes like this, finally. By the way, my mom hasn't seen the inside of a church unless somebody fucking dies or gets married. So I love how she acts all Catholic. Um, first of all, she's 98 years young. Still got it? The day the photo went live, May 30th, 2017, the day that changed my life irrevocably, um, in the middle of all the crazy stuff and the walls caving in, and I'll get to that part later, my own mother calls me, and I swear to God, she goes, for Christ's sake, Kathleen, of all the goddamn clubs you could have joined. I go, Ma, I was watching my Sean Hannity. I go, Mother, what are you doing watching that for? He says you joined Al-Qaeda. Could you collect stamps or something instead of joining Al-Qaeda? Like it's a caterpillar relative or something. So um, anyway, just so you know, after that phone call on that day, I'm laughing now, but I was sobbing. I called Rosie O'Donnell, the preeminent expert at being trolled by Donald Trump. 12 years he's been trying to take her down, 12 years. So I call Rosie and I'm crying and I go, my own mother thinks I'm in ISIS, but she calls it Al-Qaeda anyway. She thinks I'm in ISIS. And Rosie goes like this, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's hilarious, tape it. <laughs> God damn it. Okay, um, I had taken some other photos, and one of them was a spoof of my former neighbor, Kim Kardashian. And I'll tell you, I'm gonna be honest, it was actually kind of exciting living next to them. So don't get high and mighty on me and act like you don't wanna know what it's like to go to their house, because you do, you do, you do. Admit it! Yeah. Beg me! Yeah. I am so committed, I moved in next to my act. <laughs> Show some goddamn respect. So. And by the way, don't turn on me, but after the Trumpers wanting to assassinate me for a year and a half, I'm totally pro-Kardashian. Don't turn on me, hear, hear me out. Okay, so when the Trumpers let you know on a daily basis that they wanna, because their assassination um, method of choice is, we wanna shoot you in the cunt, cut your head off, stuff your decapitated head up your cunt, and shoot it again. All right, so after a year and a half of that, if the Kardashians are merely stupid and materialistic, where do I sign? I'll take it. I'll take it, sounds good to me. As long as you're not trying to actively assassinate me, we're BFFs, we are, we are good. We are cool, I'll take it. And also, after the Trump photo, when I was really hunkered down in my house, I will say I could just look out the window and see some crazy amusing shit. So anyway, um, I actually didn't really, I legit didn't want Kim to think I was gonna, gonna like single white female stalk them or anything, so I see her in the driveway one day and I said, okay, well I've kinda got the house together. Do you feel like coming over for a tour? And she goes, literally? I go, no, figuratively. So, um, <laughs> sorry, at least in my worries, at least in my worries. So anyway, um, she's wearing this big puffy camouflage jacket, which is funny, like hiding the moneymaker, right? And no pants. I'm sure she had bike shorts on or something, and the heels were this high, right? And I said, do you wanna come over? And she was like, okay, I can like literally be there in like literally 30 minutes. I literally have to go to the grocery store. And by the way, I gotta say, I love that about them. Like they just go to the grocery store like that. There were no cameras. I'm like, you're gonna be really a little overdressed for the Safeway. Okay, I'm gonna be honest, they could not have been better neighbors. Like, they were super quiet, super respectful, they were a breeze. And what's good for me is that, you know, for years they've hated me because I'm like the red-haired bitch who calls them dirty whores and stuff. Because um, I'm a patriot. And... <laughs> First of all, I'm friends with the mom. Um, I'm friends with Kris Jenner because I have to be, I'm scared of her. Um, I will say this before I totally tear them to shreds. I will say that truly, by coincidence, the day the photo went live, I already had a, a, like a pre-planned dinner at my house with, of all people, Kris Jenner, an Academy Award nominee, Melanie Griffith from Working Girl, you know Melanie. And 
as much as I love to make fun of them, I have to say they couldn't have been nicer. And by the time dinner time came around, already my life was like ruined, and I was in PJs and sobbing all day. And I'll tell you about all the crazy conversations I had that day. And so Chris、uh, Jenner was the perfect person to talk to. I'm not kidding. Here's why: I had made that horrible apology video, and we'll get there in a minute. But it's a fucking shit fest. So, <laughs> so by the time they got there, I was crying again. I was like, and then I apologize, and now all my comedian friends are mad at me. But people think I'm an ISIS. So I, had, you know, all right. So there was unhinged, unhinged. So, so I'm a wreck. Chris Jenner is here. Melanie Griffith is here. And then I'm saying, you know, oh, you should have made the apology video. And she's cold as ice. And she's like this. No, it's good you apologized. We do it all the time. One of the girls steals a trademark, and then when they get caught, they just apologize. All right, so I thought that was kind of genius. So then Melanie Griffith, who couldn't be more different, she's more sort of bohemian and stuff. So Melanie goes, "I loved it. Tomorrow you should do Pence's head." All right, that. It was kind of funny. I won't. I'm not going to do it. All right, so. Prior to the famous picture, Tyler Shields and I had taken some really silly ones, and one of them, of course, I had to spoof my neighbor Kim. Now, our yards were so close that there was actually a shared wall, so it was like almost the same yard, right? So one night, and you can look this up. I'm sure it's a very famous photographer. She was doing a photo shoot in the backyard, and she was up a tree like a squirrel, like this, <laughs> totally naked. With the long, flowing extensions and everything, totally naked and glowy, and wearing nothing but、um, like '80s black Doc Martin boots. Okay, the, you know you're so fucking jaded. That don't act like you wouldn't fucking kill to walk out in your yard and be like, "Is that?" Fucking... Is Kim Kardashian a naked squirrel next door? So, so I go out there and I go. Honey, your nipples are hard. You're gonna poke an eye out. Come on, come on down, honey. Let's go, honey. Come on down. You're gonna hurt yourself. Put on a sarong. Start somewhere.、Um, and she laughed, and that's why I like her. All right, so, so, all right, so let me go back to the day. So when the photo happened, I was in the middle of a 50-city tour, and I was about 25 cities in, and then the photo came out, and without within 12 hours, I had the entire tour canceled, and not one day of paid work ahead of me for the rest of my life. So we'll get to that fun part in a minute. But the year before that, I did an 80-city like a boss tour all around America. So don't talk to me about the real America, Fox News. I have really, really been there, and I stumbled across something that I. Brought for you, and you're being such an amazing audience already. This is your first treat. Enjoy. Now, this is from something that I've never heard of, and you can make fun of me. Called Craigslist Personals Missed Connections. <laughs> all right, you know you all look like a bunch of guilty whores, a bunch of guilty, <laughs> dirty whores. Look at you. I know that gay guilt. I can hear it. That uncomfortable. <laughs> I never think I've heard of it. All right, so. <laughs> Subject line was "You fingered me at Kathy Griffin." <laughs> We were sitting next to each other at Kathy Griffin. You were drunk and flirty, and before I knew it, you slid your hands down the back of my pants and fingered my butt. <laughs> You are very cute. I'd like to get to know you. <laughs> For the gays. I've been saying it, ladies, for decades. The gay boys eliminate the middleman. They go right to the misconnection. Now look. <laughs> By the way, you may want to take a moment to look around at your neighbor and see if anyone's having a misconnection <laughs> at this moment. Love is love. Love is love.、Um, I also like that the guy who wrote that said at the end, "I'd like to get to know you better." <laughs> so, you know, I've been in the community, as they say, as an ally for so long. I'm assuming that means that they're going to be praying to Saint Christopher later, like a bar stool. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to tell you about the day. You ready? Okay. So. Um, first of all, like I said, I'm going to be very honest. I'm 58 years old, and being a 58-year-old female in this business in stand-up comedy, they've been trying to put me out to pasture since I was about 40, and I will not moo. So, 
I just want to make you laugh. I don't care if it's a commercial or a series or a special or a tour. I just want to make you laugh. So, like I said, I need to tell you the story because the government shouldn't be able to take your ability to make a living away. So, and I'll tell you all the crazy shit that I learned along the way, like the fucking TMZ connection. Holy fuck balls. Wait till that shit goes down. All right, so yes, you came to the right bitch. All right, so if I had a sword, that's what I would call it. All right, so... So what happened was, um, Andy Cohen, oh yeah, fuck him, he's a turncoat. And also, um, well, I'm sorry, if he has a skill set, I'd love to hear what it is. Nobody? Okay. Um, I love how this industry crowd was like, oh my God, you are never gonna work. I know. Um, one of the things I want you to take away from tonight is I'm Kathy Griffin and I never learned my lesson. Oh yeah, I'm fucking naming names. I don't give a shit anymore. Okay, so anyway, let me go back to the infamous day because believe it or not, what started it was a fucking tweet from Eddie Munster, of all people. Like, yes, that's how I knew I was the test case. All right, so get this shit. So like I said, when you had taken a bunch of really obviously silly, funny photos that never saw the time of day, because the infamous mask catch-up photo was of course the last picture of the day and it took 20 minutes. Now, when the picture went live, I certainly didn't think he would send it to TMZ. Like, I'm so foolish, I thought that he would send it to like Der Spiegel, right? Or Paper or Charlie Hebdo or some shit. All right, now the reason it was bad that it went to TMZ is it turns out that gay Republican and full-on Trump supporting maggot Harvey Levin Yes, a gay man who's a maggot, not just a Republican, a full MAGA-wearing, Trump-loving. So when I announced that on what's called the YouTube, then the right wing said, you know, I was on Hinge. And then I was so happy when the Daily Beast finally did an article where Harvey Levin said, oh yeah, I talked to Trump multiple times a week. I consider myself to be his personal publicist. Exactly. Now, we all enjoy TMZ as a guilty pleasure blog, but I'm suggesting to you, if you keep looking at it, you'll see it's very misogynistic and very racist. And Harvey has like all the dirt on people and he's got a vault and everybody's scared of him. Well, open the fucking vault, motherfucker. I don't give a shit because what happened was the picture went on TMZ first. <laughs> now, you know people in LA think that shit is the newspaper. You know. <laughs> You know it to be true. You know there are people that are like, I heard on the news. No, <laughs> it's a blog for God's sake. By the way, talking to the president multiple times a week, can you imagine Barack Obama calling Perez Hilton for policy advice? <laughs> All right, so prior to the mask photo, we had taken pictures like me spoofing Kim and pictures that I honestly just thought if they show up in a magazine and make you laugh, it's worth it. Or if I put them on social media and you laugh, it's worth it, right? So that's it. There was no deep meaning. Now, when we get to the actual infamous photo, then I admit the inspiration was when uh, Trump famously said after one of the, the debates about Megyn Kelly, there was blood coming out of her eyes, blood coming out of her wherever. And even though I don't mean to defend her because she wouldn't piss on me if I were on fire, I still thought, well, let's do a picture where there's blood coming out of his wherever and see if he likes it. Um, he didn't. He didn't like it one bit. Did not care for it. Now, here's why I feel fucking stupid. One of the many reasons is because I hate the celebrities that go, I wouldn't change a thing, right? I fucking hate that. When people ask me that, you know, do you have any regrets? Yes, yes. Are you kidding? Too many to count. And they're always like, oh, like they take their pen out like, oh, no one says that. And I go, my biggest regret, not fucking Ray J on tape. <laughs> that one alone. Months later, Hillary Clinton puts it in her audio book about my photo scandal. And she says something like, you know, I can't believe all, all of the fallout from the photo Kathy Griffin took. She was clearly doing a send up of Perseus and Medusa. <laughs> which I was. <laughs> all right, I didn't go to college, all right? I started doing commercials at 17. So I was like, Perseus and Medea? Like, is it a Tyler Perry thing? <laughs> I, all I'm saying is if you hear me say in an interview that it was inspired by Perseus and Medusa, just fucking back me up, just back me up. <laughs> just be like, oh my God, she's a Rhodes Scholar. All right, so. So no, it wasn't based on anything but me just trying to put ketchup on a mask and shame him. And honestly, in my world, you guys know me, I've been doing this shit for years. And I really thought this photo will have a shelf life on like two gay blogs for two days. 
I, that is the max. Like, I really, truly had no idea that they already had the apparatus, which we'd all seen, but it had been used primarily on his political opponents, Little Marco, Lion Ted, I mean, that shit's true, but I didn't know that the minute that photo went to TMZ, the Trump wood chipper was up and running. And the idea that the objections would come from the White House, I mean, this, my story, like it or not, is historic, and never in the history of this great country has a sitting United States president used the power of the Oval Office, the so-called First Family, uh, the Department of Justice and the right-wing media to try to decimate an American citizen, much less an American comedian. So anyway, just what you know, it <laughs> really happen. It can happen, everybody. Vigilant, let's all be vigilant. All right, so, um, <laughs> um, so, so what happened was uh, the photo goes on TMZ and I swear to God, I go back to bed. I go back to bed, I thought nothing of it. The, the photographer called me and he goes, all right, the photo's online and it's, it's going everywhere. It's spreading like wildfire. And I was like, great, I go back to bed. Not even kidding. <laughs> so what wakes me up? A call from Rosie O'Donnell. And she calls and she goes, Griffin, it's O'Donnell. <laughs> and I was kind of tired and I go, what's up, bro? And she goes, Griffin, everybody thinks you're an ISIS. I go, you're a riot, I hang up. I swear to God, because you know comics, that's how we talk to each other. And I thought that was kind of a funny joke. Ring. Griffin, it's O'Donnell. Oh, Jesus, what? So she's like, seriously, people honestly think you're in ISIS. So I put on CNN, and um, here's what I've learned from this experience. It turns out um, there is such a thing as bad publicity. <laughs> People ask me all the time, why did you make the apology video? And I'll tell you why. Um, I have performed in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've performed in Kuwait and Uzbekistan. I performed uh, in the battle zone under mortar fire. What if Daniel Pearl's mother saw the photo? Honestly, that's why I made the apology video. That's it. And I, it was, when I say it was a narrow apology, I mean it was like practically just for her. Because what I found out now in talking to people over the last year and a half is so many of the folks that were so offended by the photo and thought I was inciting violence, inciting with ISIS, and all this stuff, I would ask them, and I'd get a little more bold as the year and a half went on, and I would say, are you military? Is it, has it triggered you in this way? And 99% of them were dudes that had never been in the military and go, no, but I've watched those on YouTube and they're gross. Okay, if that tried to have a good time, go fuck yourself. Apology rescinded, apology rescinded. If you're watching real decapitation videos on YouTube, then my picture's quite harmless and you should know better, you psycho. All right. So uh, it goes on TMZ, and then, like I said, it took off. So I put on the news, and it's boom, 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 breaking news. And, oh, yes, oh, yes. No call or anything, but the famous CNN is letting go of comedian Kathy Griffin for the New Year's Eve broadcast. Oh, can I tell you the one that hurt? Boom, 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 ticker. Kathy Griffin dropped as the international spokeswoman for Squatty Potty. <laughs> hurt, all right? First of all, I was damn proud to be the face of Squatty Potty, god damn it. <laughs> That's right. And the commercial was called Kathy Griffin is the Queen of Poop. <laughs> and I wore that crown proudly, god damn it. Every day, it may have been invisible, but I was the Queen of Poop and that meant something. So, boom, boom, boom. So that somehow was breaking news and stuff. So, but like I said, the walls were just caving in and then the tweet heard around the world, the dad, the accidental president, Donald Trump, I brought it. So here, here was the one, because, you know, uh, New York Magazine wrote uh, a pretty favorable article about me a few months ago, and it kind of started the turnaround. Um, and the writer had a great line in there saying that for the first time in history, a president's Twitter feed is the most powerful programming tool in television. Because every time he tweets something crazy enough, boom, 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 breaking news. All right, so by the way, can you even imagine Obama or even W ever commenting on a comic, ever? All right, here we go. So this is from the accidental president. Kathy Griffin should be ashamed of herself. My children, especially my 11-year-old son, Baron, are having a hard time with this sick. Okay. Um, I'm gonna suggest Baron has seen worse on a fucking Wednesday, okay? <laughs> really? Like the Access Hollywood tape alone, I think was a little bigger than a fucking mask, but okay, it's about the children, right? So, that one. 
He's paying off porn stars. He's admitting to affairs. All right, so uh, once again, once, once that happens, then the tour cancellations started coming in. So I got you know, a call from my then stand-up agent, and he said, okay, well, you know, one theater got a bunch of death threats, and they're canceling the show. And I said, all right, I've been through this before. I can weather this storm. And then somehow TMZ was reporting every one of my tour cancellations in real time, like the same time I was hearing about them. All right, so I know it sounds crazy to think that they were coordinating with the White House, but I'm pretty sure they fucking were. And that's where we are, and I know how nuts that is. So then fucking Melanie chimes in. Get this shit. Same day. So Melanie writes, as a mother, wife, and a human being. <laughs> you guys, are we so Handmaid's Tale that even the first lady is like, I better assert on Twitter that I'm a human being, like, <laughs> just to see if I still am. All right. That photo makes you wonder about the mental health of the person who did it. Well, back at you, bitch. <laughs> I really do care. So, you know, I'm going to be honest. It was, some people were nice and some people were really tough, you know. And I, like I said, I believe honesty is key. And, um, you know, I was, it was hard to see how many people went out of their way to, like, twist the knife. And, look, I, I loved Al Franken as a senator. I had many fundraisers for him at my home. And he called me that day and he just said, Kathy, what were you thinking? And I was going to host two book events for him for free. And he goes, I can't be associated with you now. I did. I started crying so bad, I just couldn't even finish the call. So I loved him as a senator, okay? So I'm, but I'm just being honest. It was fucking rough. And then I had other celebrities telling me, you know, <laughs> Sharon Stone goes, you have to leave the country for eight years. I go, you first. <laughs> like, like, I got just a lot of really crazy advice at a time when I already felt super crazy. And then my mother is telling me, now you can finally be a dental hygienist, which is her real dream. Uh, <laughs> The other tweet heard around my world, the Anderson Cooper tweet. Now we're gonna go there because I know it's what you showed up for and I'm gonna give you the tea. I'm opening the pot, I'm gonna spill some right now. All right, so here's the deal. I don't have a punchline for this one. It just hurt and it just sucked and that's all there is to it. But everyone knows that feeling, whether you're at you know, the office party or the relative Christmas party or whatever, where if you're kind of getting dogpiled, you always know that one person is gonna have your back no matter what. Well, I was wrong. And, uh, you know, by the way, like I said, everybody came at me that day and I already lost everything and been fired from everything and all this stuff. So, you know, I just want you to know, I, I really don't think Anderson had to write the tweet, but I did bring it. <laughs> All right, so here we go. For the record, I am appalled by the photo shoot Kathy Griffin took part in. It is clearly disgusting. Okay, so, you know, I had to just take that one in, no call, but I thought, all right, this is, this is just that kind of a day, and like I said, I was getting all kinds of crazy calls. So, sure enough, the Anderson Cooper tweet, you know, was, was hurtful. Um, now, when I tell you that the death threats started the day of the photo, they started online, and unfortunately, once again, everybody here knows what that's like. Everyone knows what a cesspool social media can be. But I actually got, um, today wasn't my first call from the FBI. We're old friends. So, <laughs> so that day, they actually called, and they said, Miss Griffin, you're under several what we deem to be uh, called credible threats. Uh, the online threats, you know, they would look at, but um, the very next day, I started getting old-timey, old-fashioned mail threats with stamps, because old people love Trump and they fucking love stamps, too. <laughs> hand in hand. And, and so then the FBI had to teach us how to separate the ones that are definitely credible threats, and we have to put them in a Ziploc bag, and then they take them. And then there's another pile where we, like, discuss it, and they tell us which ones are credible. And then there's another pile, frankly, that's just for my act. All right, so <laughs> you gotta laugh. At this point, you gotta laugh. All right, so the day after the photo was live, I then received truly a sack of mail, like in an old-time sitcom or something. So, oh yes, yes, lots of ways to shoot me in the cunt. And 90, you know, 8% of them were, you, you, you know, let's just say negative. And there were a handful of nice ones, and I'm going to be honest because I'm doing a lot of whining, but there were some that were really touching, and I spent a lot of time in the first couple of months just returning them and saying, you know, thank you. So I got this one on the outside, and normally, you know, I wouldn't have opened it, but I just knew. And on the outside of it, it said, from Bobby from Sarasota. Now, as you know, I've been an A in the LGBTQIA2345 community for many years. So somehow I knew, I knew that this was gay Bobby from Sarasota. 
I knew that Bobby knew he needed no last name. He was Bobby from Sarasota. Everybody in Sarasota knows Bobby. You fucking kidding me? You can call the mayor of Sarasota right now and say, where's gay Bobby? And say at the diner. They all know him. They all know him. All right, so the day after the photo, I get a letter from Bobby from Sarasota, and it couldn't have been nicer. It was very supportive and very sweet. And then I noticed there was a second letter in the envelope that was a totally separate letter to Anderson Cooper. So I remember thinking, oh shit, Bobby, you fucked up. You accidentally put the Anderson letter in here. Then at the bottom of the letter he wrote to me, he wrote, and Miss Griffin, I am including the letter I've already sent to Anderson Cooper for your perusal. <laughs> First of all, um, let me just say that there are a lot of words in this letter that are wrong and inappropriate. And I also may have laughed out loud three times. All right, so here we go. Bobby from Sarasota. And also, let me just guarantee you, Anderson Vanderbilt has never gotten a letter like this in his life. <laughs> Anderson, from one homo to another, you're a fickle faggot. <laughs> Bobby's pissed, pissed. Really, not supporting and backing Kathy Griffin after she had your back for years? Even didn't talk about your cock sucking in her comedy back when you were still a closeted queen? All right, and this is what I love about the gays. He ends it in textbook style. Homo 101, you always back your fag hag. I love gay Bobby. When I played Sarasota, I invited him. He was just like you think. He's like, bitch, you got a raw deal. I was like, Bobby. Um, <laughs> oh, the other thing I have to tell you is I would say, no joke, about a third of the death threats that came in the old timey mail to my house had actual real return addresses. <laughs> the Trumpers are not like academics. That I'm just, <laughs> he loves the uneducated. All right, so. When I would hand one of those to an FBI agent, it was the funniest thing. Because you hand someone a death threat with an actual return address, <laughs> and he goes like this. Oh. <laughs> well, I will have an answer in three minutes. <laughs> really streamlines the process, I have to say. It was, it was obviously a very crazy day, but I have to be honest, I got two calls personally. One was from Jamie Foxx. And I say that because I really don't even know him. So it was really meant a lot that he like tracked me down. And the other one was from someone else I don't really know that well, but Jim Carrey tracked me down. And here's the thing, I, I don't know him very well. I've met him a few times over the years, but I actually think he's really accomplished kind of everything you possibly could want in comedy. He's an amazing stand-up, amazing sketch artist, in living color, Ace Ventura franchise, serious actor, you know, impressionist, all these things. So he calls me up and believe it or not, normally, obviously I would like be a fan girl and be like, oh, Oh my God, Jim Carrey's calling, what's going on? And you know, be trying to make him laugh or whatever. But when you're in a situation this uh, dire, you just cut to the chase. So I hear Jim Carrey's on the phone. So I was already sobbing and I said, Jim, I'm 58 years old, I'm a big girl, I've been in this business 40 years, but I need someone to really, really be honest with me. And I need someone like you to just be honest and just tell me, is it over for me? If I know it's over, I can kind of try to rejigger my brain and think about what my future would be, but I needed to hear it from someone like that. And I said, I can take it. I just need to hear, just go for it. And he goes, Kathy, today, you're the most famous comedian in the world. <laughs> to Mary Tyler Moore from the Dick Van Dyke Show, right? Oh, Rob! So 
he couldn't have been nicer. And he said, look, he goes, you've got the worst president in the history of this country who's basically put his thumb on the shoulder of your life and is trying to ruin you. He goes, I think, honestly, any comedian would give their right arm to have this happen to them. Because at the end of this, and I, this phrase just always stuck with me, he goes, you're going to take as long as time as you need to process it, and then you're going to put it through your Kathy Griffin comedy prism, and you're going to make the story funny and relatable, and you're going to go tell it. So thank you, Jim Carrey. Um, all right, so, so what actually happened the next day was I got a call from my um, entertainment attorney and then later my First Amendment attorney, his name Alan Isaacman, and he won the landmark Supreme Court case, Jerry Falwell versus Hustler Magazine. Because when you're in this much trouble, you want the guy that got Larry Flint off in front of the Supreme Court, okay? That's what you want. So, so anyway, he says, um, hey kid, I gotta tell you something. And whatever he starts with, with that, it's not good, right? And I was like, God, now what? I'd already lost you know, my living, my future, you know, all this other stuff. And he goes, um, I just got a call from the Department of Justice and they're putting you under what's called an open-ended investigation. And I just started shaking. You know, I've never been arrested or anything. I don't know anything about this world. And I said, did I do something wrong? And he said, no. And I said, did I break the law? He said, no. And I said, did I violate the First Amendment in any way? And he goes, no. So I said, okay, what, is, like, what does this mean? He goes, well, right now they put you on the no-fly list. So I want to tell you guys that because a lot of people don't know that. I was on the no-fly list for two months, like a fucking terrorist. So then I said, okay, w w okay, I guess I'm not going anywhere, but what, is that in what else could they do? And he said, look, I've been dealing with, because a lot of people don't know I was investigated by two federal agencies, the Secret Service and the AUSA, the Assistant U.S. Attorney's Office. So they had that prosecutor ready to file charges if they found anything. And um, I said, well, what's, what should I do or what can I expect? And he said, well, look, they can do something called a no-knock raid. Well, because of Michael Cohen and Paul Manafort, we all know what that is now. Months later, I was bragging to my girlfriends. Uh-huh. It's a no-knock rate. Yeah. So it means they don't even have to knock. Get it? No-knock. And they come like around five in the morning, because that's when I'm sleeping. So, oh yes, I had to learn all this. I'm very versed in all this. I had to learn who all the Nazis are that come after me, what their names are, what their gripe is, all the far-right groups, all the conspiracy theories. This is my world now. This is my fucking timeline. All right, so anyway, he says they're opening uh, an open-ended investigation. And after the no-knock raid, I said, well, is there anything else that I should be prepared for? And he said, look, they have the right, if they want to, to tap your phone. And now I can laugh about it, but it's a weird feeling. But the reason I laugh now is I think if they were tapping my phones, which I actually don't think they were, they would be just hearing me talking to one of my gay friends about last night's RuPaul's Drag Race. Like that would be <laughs> Miss Vanjie. Miss Vanjie. Miss Vanjie. Picturing like the old fashioned FBI guy outside in the van, like with the beats by Dre, like who's this Miss Vanjie? Is she an ISIS? Is she a very high ranking member of ISIS? Track down Miss Vanjie. Good luck. Um, she'll fucking cut a bitch. So, anyway, um, he sa I said, well, when you say open investigation, you know, what does that mean? And he said, it means they can keep it open as long as they want. And I said, okay, well, it, then what happens? And he said, well, they investigate you as long as they feel is appropriate, and then they decide whether or not to charge you with a crime. And I said, okay, well, I thought I didn't break the law. And he said, they're considering charging you with conspiracy to assassinate the President of the United States, which holds a lifetime sentence. You didn't know that part, did you? All right, so we're gonna go back there in a minute because I can tell you're horrified. By the way, last week, I was walking down the street in San Francisco, and four middle-aged people stopped me and started screaming, you're an ISIS, you're a terrorist, you don't deserve to live here. I know, and what's weird is they were like my age, and the dude was a parrot head. You know what that is? It's like a Jimmy Buffett super fan. So they're screaming at me that I'm a terrorist, and I gotta admit, I was fascinated by his fucking shirt with parrots on it, and he fucking loves Margaritaville, this guy. And I know it's an odd reaction when someone's screaming, go back to Raqqa, you're an ISIS and a terrorist, but I said, is that a parrot head? Um, 
that's my new life, my new normal. All right, so when I was able to actually travel and leave the country, I called my then agent and I said, I know this is a very unique way to route a tour, but is there any way we can actually consciously look for countries where we know they hate Trump? Two weeks later, I had 15 countries in 23 cities. <laughs> That's right. Another part of the story is once I finally got off the no-fly list, I was on what's called the Interpol list. So I was detained at every single airport, which sort of sounds fun or like no big deal, but it's fucking scary. And what I'm here to tell you, because there actually is a lot of misinformation going out around this, they actually can take your phone and SIM card and your passport. So don't believe like that's against the law, it's unethical, they can. So what happened when I was on the Interpol list was every single airport from LAX to London Heathrow to you know everywhere, um, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of like the three people working at the airport, right? So I was most scared in Singapore because it's illegal there to chew gum and spit. So, you know, me with my fucking pussy jokes. Like, <laughs> I'm already pushing it. And I know a lot of the audience members are gonna be gay and it's illegal to be gay there. So I don't wanna be detained while they're sweating in their knockoff poochie scarves. Cause that's, <laughs> that's not love. All right, so. Every time I would get detained, it would go like this. I go and the first person scans my passport and you see them go like this. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So then I would put on my, I'm not an ISIS face. <laughs> Never worked once, turns out. Then they would call their supervisor. The supervisor would scan my passport, then they'd go, Oh yeah, to this day, I don't know what the fuck is on that passport. And then they send me into a room alone and they take my phone and my passport and they just go away for an indeterminate amount of time. So that can happen, just want you to know that. All right, now out of all the times I was detained, only one time was there another person in there with me. Look, I, once a comedian, I was a comedian. I couldn't resist. I just turned and I said, what are you in for? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that guy's way smarter than I because he didn't even fucking look at me. He was like, oh, the crazy redhead from the picture? I don't think so. No, no, no. And then eventually I would get my stuff back and thank God I didn't have to miss any shows. All right, so, um, oh, the other thing I have to tell you is I love Stevie Nicks and I'm here to tell you she is the real deal. Like she's the most Stevie Nicksy person you would have, you've ever met. Yeah. And she really lives it. Like she's always in like the multi layers of paisley layers and fucking witch boots. All right, so I know that you would think a friendship with me and Stevie Nicks is unlikely because she's, you know, like Stevie Nicks and I'm like D-list and everything. But I love a legend who lets me give them a little shit. So one time I was at her place and I go, honey, just give me a twirl. And I swear to God, she goes. <laughs> So, so sure enough, um, as a very nice surprise, um, when I was doing my shows in Australia, I had a show in Sydney at a little venue called the Sydney Opera House. I'll wait. It was really sweet. Stevie's tour manager secretly arranged as a surprise for the two of us to get together and spend a little time at her sound check because she, of course, was at the 20,000 person stadium and we had shows the same nights and we couldn't go see each other. So it was, it was just great. And so I get into her car and she was actually quite emotional because her good friend Tom Petty had just passed away. And she was talking about how the sound check was going to be the first time she sang Stop Dragging My Heart Around with Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders since Tom had passed away. So she talked about that for a while and so that's what we were going to watch, like pretty much the sound check of that song. And then she totally turns her focus and she goes, I've been reading about you and I'm worried about you. And she's very like matter of fact, even though she's like a, at least a Wiccan. I can't prove it, but I, I'm pretty sure there's a cauldron somewhere nearby and there's a lot of fucking sage. There's a lot of sage. And, and so um, she goes, I hear that you're getting detained at airports. And I want you to know, if anything happens to you in any city in this country, you call our team and there is nothing we can't get you out of. <laughs> you guys, I think Stevie Nicks was in SEAL Team 6. I do, I think she was like really SEAL Team 7, but she's like, don't say anything. All right, so 
sure enough, um, we get to go backstage. Now, I am incredibly honored to be here, but I'm not a stadium artist, okay? I never was. So get this shit. These stadium artists, what they do is they turn their dressing rooms into replicas of their apartments. So get this. So we walk in, and Randy was afraid to even walk in the room because the wave of estrogen coming out, he thought his uh, dick might fall off. And the other thing I like about these legends is they get to an age where they really don't give a fuck anymore. And it's heaven. Like Chrissy Hind, you know, we went to the sound check and Chrissy Hind's hair is like, you know, Tina Turner from Mad Max. And yes! And the older legends are angry all the time. It's heaven. Now, I am a complete, you know, star fucker. I love celebrities. I'm obsessed with celebrities. So if I know I'm going to meet a celebrity I haven't met, I'll do like some homework, right? So I had read that day. I thought, well, if I get a chance to talk to Chrissy Hind, I, you know, I knew she was from Akron. In Ohio, and I read that she opened a vegan restaurant. So I thought, all right, I'll have like shit to talk about. So I'm watching the two of them talk shop, and once, once again, I'm just a little gay boy, and I'm in heaven just watching them, like, ah, oh, this is great. Um, and just to set the stage, Stevie's dressing room is so Stevie Nixie. The scented candles were almost battling with one another. You walk in, and there's vanilla bean over here, lavender, musk. There's one that's just pussy. And then there's a little lull in the conversation. And I then say to Chrissy Hind, who I've never met, I said, Chrissy, um, I'm, I'm a comedian. And I've, I've played Ohio many times. I understand you're from Akron. Do you ever go back to Ohio? And Chrissy goes, fuck Ohio! <laughs> You guys, I peed a little, like a little, not even. Okay, I read that you've opened a vegan restaurant, which I think is very healthy and progressive of you. She goes, it closed! You guys, the slightest amount of diarrhea. Like not, not even that much. Um, so then Stevie Nicks has to come in and mediate. And she goes, Chrissy, this is our friend, Kathy Griffin. She is an outrageous comedian. She says whatever goes into her head and it comes out of her mouth and she seems to not be able to stop herself. <laughs> she, goes, she goes, in fact, this very story will probably be in her act. Stevie continued and she goes, but we have to support her because she's in trouble with the government because she took a picture of Donald Trump's head that we all wanted to take, except she really took it. <laughs> all right, so then Chrissy Hine goes like this. That was you? <laughs> That's punk rock! High five, high five, best friends, best friends for life. High five, best friends. Okay, this is, I'm just... I know half the people in the room like know him and like him, but I can't resist. You guys, I got a consolation note on really beautiful embossed stationery from Billy Bush. <laughs> By the way, I hope you guys know this. You know when he got canned from the Today Show, they gave him a $9 million severance package. $9 million! Now, I like to brag, I've been fired more than I've been hired. I've never gotten a $9 severance package. Jesus, where do I sign? All right, so... Um, Anyway, he sends me this note. Dear Kathy, I have real solid counsel for you if you want it. Call me anytime. Doesn't leave a phone number. <laughs> on brand, on brand. All right, so then he writes, don't speak for a while. Okay, the last thing I need is another rich middle-aged white guy telling me don't speak for a while. Unless your name is Gwen Stefani and you have the original no doubt, do not be saying don't speak to me. Only Gwen Stefani can say don't speak. And then he goes, um, do you meditate? Start. And I swear to God, I wandered right back. No, maybe if I had a $9 million yoga mat, I would, Billy. <laughs> and then he signs it, I swear to God, he signs it with, you are human. <laughs> you guys, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> is Billy Bush gonna run out here and stitch my eye like the Handmaid's Tale? What the fuck is going on? All right, I've got you a little loosened up. I brought a death threat for you. It said, from an admirer you may know, for your eyes only. I know, I like Sheena Easton much as the next guy. 
for your eyes only. I hope her sugar walls catch the morning train. And, and I open it and it says, from an older white male. What a shock that is. <laughs> really? I know. Go to hell, Kathy. And then this is what I want you to know about the Trumpers, like how random they are. You are no different than Bill Cosby. I can think of one way, but... <laughs> you were my favorite female comedian. I was there at your show last January in San Diego. All right, I'm such an asshole that I'm like, oh, you know what? This is a fan just having a moment. <laughs> you know, if he, he's a ticket-buying fan. If he came to see me in San Diego, he's just venting a little. I died laughing, now I hope you die, you cunt. <laughs> And then, like I said, because you gotta laugh at everything, this one gets me every time. You're a piece of shite. <laughs> Is anyone here even slightly Irish or Scottish or anything? <laughs> I'm quite sure this is from one of my aunts in Chicago. I'm not sure. <laughs> Kathleen, you're full of shite. You don't know shite from Shinola. Typical letting that shite come out of your mouth. Why don't you collect stamps instead of talking that shite? Um, <laughs> And then he says, because it makes sense, you can forward this to your lover, Snoop Dogg. <laughs> That's right, I wanted to write him back and go, you know what, sir, you got me. Snoop Dogg and I are lovers, and if I have even one egg left, we're gonna make a fucking Snoop omelet. <laughs> you got me, sir. And then he says, and I got a lot of this, I'm glad your sister just died of cancer, I wish it was you. <laughs> yep, all right. Then he says, fuck you up the ass with a red hot poker. Now. I've been very clear my whole career about this. I prefer a chilled poker. <laughs> I find a red hot poker is a little shocking to my anus and also chilled poker and a lot of Astro Glide, but that's me, that's me. It's a free country for now. Then he says, red hot poker, just like your precious friends on that filthy show, Will and Grace, who all fuck each other up the ass all day. And all I took away from this whole death threat was, Will and Grace is back. <laughs> all right, so, um, okay, I'm gonna, I have to tell you about something. I, I hope you get this and like this. I attended the White House Correspondents Dinner this year. Yes, what a difference a year makes. All right, so get this shit. I got into so many fights. All right, so, yes! Can you believe it? All right, so I got a call the day before, because I still didn't have a publicist, from the Washington Post, and they wanted to know if they could shadow me, because they thought it was so, like, crazy that I was going to the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Now, typically, as you can tell, that is not a good idea at all. I went in with what's called an agenda. So I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around, and there's a lot of cabinet members and stuff, and of course Trump didn't go, because he's too much of a pussy, and he could never take a joke. But one thing I want to tell you, and want you to take away, is I absolutely, with my own eyes, and I was the only other stand-up comic in the room saw Michelle Wolf do a great job with her monologue at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. I watched it. I was there in the audience. So they are not gonna take her down on my watch. And they tried. I watched them even start tweeting about it in real time, saying the whole room was leaving. Nobody was leaving. All right, we'll get there. All right, so I go and sit down, and this guy comes up to me. His name is Hogan Gidley. And he's this piece of shit that's Sarah Fuckabee's right-hand man. And I recognize him because he kind of looks like that asshole Ralph Reed from Focus on the Family. So, you know, these guys always want to start shit with me. And I'm just sitting there. So he comes up and he goes, uh, I just want to let you know we are gonna build the wall. And I'm drinking a Mexican beer. I know, and I go, bye Nazi. <laughs> I don't know what it is about straight guys, but if you blow on them, they fucking freak out. <laughs> like it was, it's my new thing. Cause they're like, he was like a cat. Like he thought he was gonna really have one. And he was like. Okay, so then I stood right outside the men's room and then none of them could get away from me. It was heaven. And I had a fucking train longer than Stormy pulling a double in Tuscaloosa. And <laughs> yes, yes. So I realized that's where they couldn't get away from me, right? Um, so I would wait for them to come out of the bathroom. So the first one was that piece of shit, Wilbur Ross, who's like 150. So he comes down and he's like, bruh, bruh, bruh. you know, he's like a Simpsons character. And so he doesn't recognize me or know who I am. And I go, time to retire, <laughs> like that. <laughs> I 
know, it's weird, but it was so much fun. Then Gary Cohn comes down, one of the, the economic advisors, and I go, Gary Cohn, what do you know? You got canned two weeks ago, so desperate for a free meal. <laughs> I fucking picked him off one after one with a simple <laughs> and Oh yeah, uh, Tom Bosser, I mean, and just one after another. And then I would accuse them specifically of the crimes that I'm quite sure they're guilty of. All right, so then the piece of shit Brian Kilmeade comes out from Fox and Friends, right? Now, here's the thing, I admit, uh, a lot of people don't know this, Fox and Friends wasn't always a propaganda show, much less even a political show. I used to go on Fox and Friends when they very first started, and they were sort of trying to be a knockoff of the Today Show or GMA. So I actually used to go on Fox and Friends and do cooking segments with Richard Simmons. Yes! <laughs> Who's missing? <laughs> He's missing. Where, where is he over there? Why won't they? All right, so... So anyway, Brian Kilmeade comes down and like, you know, like all these other pieces of shit guys that have, you know, Trumpers that have dogpiled on me. The first thing he says is, can I get a selfie? I go, no, Nazi, you can't get a selfie. What the fuck is the matter with you? Propagating this bullshit to the president you know he believes. When I used to do your piece of shit show, you were the sports girl and Steve Ducey was the weather girl. Do your job. <laughs> And you should know that, like, of course I had a fantasy that Trump didn't go only because he was afraid of me. Like, that of course was an insane fantasy he had, but I have one that's even more insane. You ready? This guy gets up and leaves, and his name is Matt Schlapp, and he runs that thing CPAC, which used to be just a sort of conservative convention, and now they have, like, Nazis, and Steve Bannon was their big get, and everything, so he's a fucking psycho. I will also say, she is a lady. Oh my God, okay. Let me just say, yeah, get nervous, because I'm fucking going there. Um, and here's why. Like I said, I have traveled this country. Well, I could be a pilot practically at this point. I've traveled and traveled. I've gone to every city, large and small. And let's face it, not every place is, you know, New York and L.A. There's many, many places in America where you just can't come out. There's many places where, frankly, it's just not safe to be gay. So over these decades, I've done many, many events where I'm in, you know, the South, or typically the South, and let's say I'm doing a book signing, and then a guy like Matt Schlapp comes up to me. Hey, girl! Oh, my God, fierce diva. I love your book. So does my wife, Edna. <laughs> and then, right, we all have that person in our life, whether it's a relative or a coworker, and you kind of have that moment of like, okay, I'll play. And you look at Edna, God love her, she's 600 pounds. He hasn't touched her since the wedding night when he took Viagra and was watching Channing Tatum videos on his iPad. But, you know, that's the quilt that is America. So, so anyway, this guy's a piece of shit. Now get this shit, his, his wife is named Mercedes and she's in the administration as like one of those accidents. Like when Scott Pruitt tried to get his wife a Chick-fil-A, remember that shit? So they will just take fucking anybody apparently. She has no qualifications or anything. She's also the woman that stood up for the girl who said, it doesn't matter about John McCain's vote, he's gonna die soon anyway. So this bitch Mercedes, Schlapp, S-C-H-L-A-P-P. -P. She <laughs> stood up for that girl, right? So anyway, um, they leave the event and I see Matt Schlapp is tweeting that Michelle Wolf is a disaster and everyone, the room is getting emptied and everyone's booing and the event's been ruined. And it was those two leaving, right? So sure enough, I uh, left the event, go to the MSNBC party because I thought there might be like some friendlies. And I'm there talking to a couple friends and who walks in but fucking Matt Schlapp and his wife. So they left early to get free drinks at the MSNBC party. And yet going online trying to, once, once again, take down Michelle Wolf and say that everyone left and she did very, very well. So anyway, I'm, I'm not, I, like I didn't really have it in mind to start with him. I'd already been in like four fights by that point. So I'm talking to a couple pals and then he comes up and the wife comes up to me. And I've never said a word to her. I, she wasn't really on my radar and she comes up to me like people are wont to do a lot these days. Well, you're a female comedian. I suppose you think what she did was funny. Well, it was crass and vulgar and may have ruined the event forever. <laughs> I didn't call for you. <laughs> when I do, you'll know. Because I'm gonna spot you in that knockoff Jessica McClintock, half off Macy's basement dress, mouth fucking away. <laughs> so. If you're gonna step up to me, Scarlett O'Hara, move your fucking hoop before I move it for you, or whatever it was. And it was 
was so great because she didn't know that Washington Post was there and the guys were like, holy shit. It was really funny because Dana Bash and Don Lemon were just like, okay, let's just let this kind of air itself out. And then this bitch does not know when to stop. So she's coming at me and I'm like, honey, you're like the 18th person. I'm happy to go to battle at this point. So I'm a grown middle-aged woman screaming at this bitch. And then the husband does what I've seen many times, the gay pivot. He's got like a, you know, a, like a high ball or something. And he just, he's watching two bitches fight. And he just goes like, at all. He was like happy to watch the whole fucking shit fest. So uh, as you guys, when I, when I read the, uh, the uh, infamous death threat, when the guy mentioned my sister passing away, um, you know, a couple things that happened, because I, I really do want you guys to know how serious and crazy these Trumpers are. So um, during that period, my mom got death threats to her retirement village and they tracked her down somehow and that really scared her a lot. But um, even worse than that was that my sister, uh, Joyce, was dying of cancer in a hospital and uh, she got death threats until the day she died. <laughs> okay, comedy show, comedy show. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and I love you and thank you, thank you. So, okay, so there's the kind of pressure that they'll put on somebody if they just fucking feel like it. All right, so um, when it came time for the interrogation, um, months had passed and Every single day, this is where your tax dollars went. Every single day, Alan would call me and say, the DOJ called again. Every day. Is she coming in? Is she coming in tomorrow? Is she coming? Can you get her to come in? So finally, I said, you know, think that's what they have Jeff Sessions and the <laughs> Department of Justice is, is doing, right? So I said, what, what do they mean, am I coming in? And he said, they want you to go downtown to the jail downtown. When I said, what do you mean? And he goes, look, I'm negotiating with them, but you know, they're, they're messing with you. They, they don't have anything, but they're messing with you. And I said, okay, wh what, do you, what does this mean? And he said, they want you to do um, a perp walk in a jumpsuit and cuffs. They want the video of that. Okay, I'm a prudent woman. Some may say cheap. I never thought I would say this to one of the most expensive lawyers in the world. I said, Alan, I don't care how much it costs. I don't care if I have to lose my house and lose everything over my dead body. Am I letting any one of you see me do a fucking perp walk in a jumpsuit for my First Amendment rights, which I did not violate? I'm not letting a woman see it. I'm not letting a person of color see it. I'm not letting a gay person see it. I don't fucking care how much it costs over my dead body. A perp walk like a common criminal. months. Two months they tried to get me to do the perp walk. So um, hundreds of thousands of dollars later, and like I said, the reason I tell this story is if, God forbid, any of you or your 13-year-old kid puts that picture up online or anywhere, they have not done anything wrong and they should not be put through this. So, all right, um, he finally negotiated so that I would be interrogated under oath in his office. So a lot of people think I was you know, interviewed or called. No, I was Put, I was interrogated under oath. So we practiced, you know, for a couple of months and he finally uh, talked them into doing it in his office in a boardroom of all places. And they had him go to my house and make sure that there were no firearms because they wanted to come over. And he said, it's kind of better if they don't come over. And I was like, all right, but whatever. So I said, well, I don't have any firearms. So we had, you know, we had practiced and the way these things work is, I just want you to know, this was not a situation where if I was messing up, he could say to the feds, I need a moment with my client and we could sort of re-strategize or anything. So um, that's what I want you guys to know, is that they were seriously considering charging me with conspiracy to assassinate the President of the United States. So we were alone in the room for a few minutes first, and he did his lawyerly duty, and he said, kid, I love you, but I'd be derelict in my duty if I didn't tell you. You fuck this up and you leave in cuffs. I said, okay, I understand. So the feds come in, and 
The first question was, uh, we understand you have a pre-existing relationship with the president. So I went through everything from the time I met him on Suddenly Susan to the, you know, charity gigs where he didn't give the money to charity. Like I had many, every possible <laughs> run in, every upfronts, every TCAs, every time I'd seen him in New York, all that stuff. And what they do, and I understand, they try to catch someone, make sure that they're not telling a lie. So then the mail agent said, and is it true you have no firearms in your home? And I said, yes, that's true. And what we all know from Michael Cohen and Paul Manafort is you do not lie to the feds. And my hand to God, I remembered it on the spot. And I was so proud of myself for being super honest that I said, oh, wait, I just remembered. I do have a um, giant uh, sword. <laughs> you guys, if you could have seen Alan's face, he was like, And then I can tell like, oh, that doesn't sound good if they think I decapitated someone. I better, I better explain it more and more and that'll make everything better. And so he then takes out the pen and paper for the first time. So I was like, shit. So now I'm like, oh, I'm so honest. I go, yep, that's right. It is a big sword and it's like medieval. Like it's got one of those leather encasements. Now, obviously it's only for display, but I'm not gonna lie, it's really big. It's got a big handle and um, it's even got an inscription on it. And so then he says, really, um, are there any distinct markings? And I don't, I don't know he means fucking blood. So I go, yes. <laughs> so proud of myself. And he's like, really, what's on the uh, sword? And I go, oh, it's inscribed to me and it says, welcome to the F list. Now, <laughs> thank God it was documented on an old episode of My Life on the D-List because I then realized this guy thought I was a sword carrying crazy ISIS decapitator. <laughs> and I was able to say, oh, I got it from um, when I hosted the Gay Porn Awards. I left that part out. <laughs> Oh yes, if you saw on my life on the D-list, there was an episode where I hosted the Gay Porn Awards, and now I'm explaining it to this FBI agent who's considering whether or not to charge me with conspiracy to assassinate the President of the United States. And Alan is looking at me like, oh God. And I'm going, yes, well, you know the gays, go big or go home, am I right? I mean, this thing is big. And um, it was like a token, like, you know what I mean? Like, a, not like an honorary, but it was like, it was like a gift, you know? And it's funny because the film that won that year, ironically, was called Justice. Um, it's funny that we're in this current situation because the film started uh, <laughs> where the main gentleman or protagonist, he started in uh, as what's called a, uh, a top. And then what happened was, he was arrested, but it wasn't like professional like this at all. In fact, frankly, it was kind of a miscarriage of justice in the movie. And during his interrogation, uh, it, was real, it was like a five-way, frankly. And it was nothing like this. Like, this is very professional. I appreciate your work. Now, in the film Justice, during his interrogation, he turns into what's called a versatile. And then... <laughs> And then by the denouement, he's what's called a full uh, pig bottom. And, <laughs> and so I got a commemorative sword. And I just want to say this film Justice, it swept that year. I mean, it got like best cinematography, best script, best actor. It was like the shape of water. And, and Alan is looking at me like, wrap up the fucking gay porn. Wrap up with the gay porn. So after that story, the male agent actually had to put his hand over his mouth because he just started laughing. So then the female agent turns to me and she asked me the one question that Alan and I had not practiced. And it really caught me off guard and I thought we had thought of every possible question. She turns to me and she says, and we're in a boardroom, she goes, Ms. Griffin, what would you do if the president walked through that door right now? Okay, you guys, I'm already a paranoid motherfucker, okay? <laughs> Also, I know this fool. Like, I can, you know, he doesn't do any presidenting. Like, I can absolutely imagine him like, hey, Mike, let's get on Air Force One and go fuck with Kathy Griffin. Come on! Like, I, I'm not kidding. I thought there was a 50-50 chance that his gunt would be bursting through that door any second. I am not kidding. I thought this is like, and so I turned to Ellen and I just go, Ellen? And he goes, answer the question. Okay, you guys know that show, Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg? All right, so like I've explained, I adore Martha Stewart. She can't stand me because I'm vulgar and crass, but I fucking love her. She's a bad bitch. For God's sake, she cooks and she's been to prison. What's not to love? <laughs> so, so I wanted you know, to talk to her when I went on that show because I, Snoop Dogg is easy to get along with and he's you know, 
you know, talking to him is very different, obviously. And so I did an episode of that show, and I wanted to talk to Martha, and here's why. It was when Trump had just declined on the escalator from hell where Mexicans are rapists, and Melanie was wearing like a lampshade or whatever the fucking outfit is. <laughs> and if you recall, if you recall, um, when Martha Stewart took over for The Apprentice, Trump was terrible to her, shit on her, did press conferences about how horrible she was, terrible. So I wanted to ask her, like, how do you deal with that now that he's actually running? So I go up to her at the beginning of the day, and I said, hey, Martha, it's good to see you. It's an honor to be here. Um, maybe at some point we can grab 15 minutes and maybe sit down and have a cup of coffee or something. And she goes like this, it's already such a long day. <laughs> I loved her more. I did. I loved her more. I can't help it. All right. By the way, two hours later, she's totally wasted on sake, and she's doing Snapchat videos with me like, woo, I'm with Kathy Griffin, and we got a long doggy tongue and crazy ears. So she loosened up a little. And so I finally got her alone, and I said, look, this is what I've been dying to ask you. I said, I can't believe that the Donald is actually running. Like, he's really running, and people might actually vote for him. And I said, he was so awful to you. How do you handle it now when you walk into rooms and you have to be faced with him? I mean, you guys kind of run in the same, like, New York money mafia circles. <laughs> And he was so vicious, what happens if he unexpectedly walks into a room? And Martha Stewart goes like this. I say hello. So for the girl who's never done anything right in her life, when the female law agent said, what would you say if the president walked through that door right now? Somehow, I channeled my inner Martha Stewart and I simply said, I'd say hello. And I was exonerated! Thank you, you guys! Thank you for coming!